probably our best description, but we talk a lot about relationships in here, networking. The, Richard is the result of networking, okay, and building relationships. Um, he has a story to tell. I've told him he can talk about whatever he wants, and it's all yours, Richard. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Uh, my name is Richard Echeria from Uganda. I'm glad to be back together. Uh, our home away from Uganda. Uh, this is the longest uh, time we've ever been outside our country. And we spent all that time here, two and a half years. So we consider Eda our next home. To give you a brief, I'm sure you've done research about Uganda, about Africa, and you know what is happening in Africa, specifically in Uganda. Through uh, Sister Rosemary and the uh, ministry, we call it a ministry, because it's a charity, she's helping out other people, she's touching other people's souls. Uh, we were able to come here through the connections and uh, the opportunity given to us by the president of the CU. We, when we talk about a connection, <coughs> we did not know about the rage. Neither did we know about the Oklahoma as the state. In Africa, we think the United States is just one thing. Like in the same way you guys think about Africa, we think Africa is like the United States. So, we get to know these guys through a friend of ours who knew our organization. Uh, about my, our childhood, me and Charles, the common thing that we had is poverty. By then, right now, we feel we are rich. Poverty is in the mind, so right now we have a rich mind. So we don't think we are poor people. So we went through this high school course called Cornerstone Leadership Academy, focusing on uh, youth leadership, development, uh, irrespective of the circumstances that we had within the background, they saw something special in us. So they take us into the program for two years, high school, for free, but you compete for it. Uh, like in my year, me and Charles we were in the same class. We were 539 people, and they needed 25 people out of the 539. So it was as hard as walking to Uganda from here. So, <laughs> Uh, we find ourselves going through a series of interviews. We find ourselves inside the program for two years. But while we were there, we went through uh, the principles. I'm sure you were in the presidential leadership class. Uh, if you have been able to read about the 70 habits of highly effective people, it's a big, interesting Right now they are eight. He added the eight before he died. Uh, we were taught things like servant leadership, sharpening the soul, uh, thinking win-win, you know. Those are the principles, integrity. And once you have those as a leader, they will, people will see them out, just out there. People will see that you have something unique. So, when we met president with his friend, we didn't know anything about him. We thought he was like any other common man. We treat everybody the same. So that's why we, you know, we treated him like any other person. That's part of our principles. Now, we find ourselves here in Eda, through the short uh, story she said. But before we came, he offered us a tip, like you guys call it a tip, thanking us. In our culture, it would mean, like in our school, it would mean that by bringing the luggage to him, it was a transaction, you know? We were doing it for, for, for the man, but we did it for a service. Because he was serving us in Uganda, uh, so there was no way we could pay back to them. These guys were in Uganda. So, but to do something good for them. So that's what we did. And it touched him, and that's why he offered us a scholarship to come and study here. And we, were, we promised him, 
we are going to go for school. Once we finish, graduate, head on. I graduated on 15th of December, 17th. By 11 o'clock, I was leaving Oklahoma City. So, I fulfilled my promise. And uh, one of our principles is promise keeping. So, I didn't break any promise for that. Now, you guys, as you are young, I don't think you have anybody above 20 years. So you are young. I remember St. Christian, we met at, a, was it in Tulsa? Yeah. Day after day, when we were in Godwin. You are young. You have a very big opportunity. Just being among the 20 people who are here, it's a great opportunity. You shouldn't take it for granted. You are the top top cream of this school, if I would say that. Because it's not like everybody walks in. You have to keep up with the grades and other things. So it shapes you to be a great leader. People confuse leadership with the politics. You know? Leadership means being a person of influence. <coughs> you can influence your family, you are a leader there. You know, you can influence your friends without position. So, just being in this class, it's a great thing, great honor and, you know, opportunity. Talking about connections and relationships. I have known Charles since 2000 when we were going through the interviews for the high school. Our school, when you join the, that school, the high school, we stay together forever. It's a family. We work so hard to help one another, to lift one another. And one of the principles of sharpening the soul, the thing that cuts, it can't cut without being sharp. So, we are sharpening the saw to be able to cut. Human beings sharpen one another. As iron sharpens the saw, so do men. Do to men. So we work as a team. We work together. We keep ourselves close. We know who is where, doing what. Uh, so we always, we have the alumni body. We stay together and we support one another, both in joy, like when someone is getting married, and in sad moments when someone loses a friend or a person. We are a thousand people right now, and I'm the president. When I went back, they voted for me. I have people who are who are like we have two congressmen, other people who are influential. We have a guy who's working with the, our embassy, Ugandan embassy in DC, Washington DC. We have people who are influential in those areas. I am heading them. I am keeping up with everybody through a team of guys who work together. So you guys, as you are here, one thing I saw, I'm sorry to say this, uh, my two and a half years being here in America, I realized that most of, like, like the majority of Americans, they, they are not relational oriented. You know, you do your thing, that's it. You can't even really know your neighbor. Uh, well, that's the culture. But what is the trend? The global trend. We are moving from that. The world is becoming one single bit. You see, you are, you are seeing Chinese, you are seeing Ugandans, we are here. So, and we are seeing Americans in Uganda. We are cutting across. You want to be that person, that unique person. They'll say, oh, where are you from? I'm from Oklahoma. Oh, those guys never used to move out of their state. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Because the trend is changing. So, and all this comes to the rational thing and the networking. You need to know who is who and where is this person? What do they do? Because that person could be the person who help you to move to the next stage. You are stuck somewhere, 
you're in school, close to graduating, this is a person who can roll you over to the next level of employment. Maybe you need a group of people to rally behind you to do something. If you don't have people, you don't have a network of people, you don't you are not relational, nobody will join you. You know, you'll have a very good, brilliant idea. But because you are not relational, they will just oh yeah, yeah, it sounds good. They disappear. Because you are not that person who is able to influence. You are not a leader. So leadership calls for responsibilities first and being able to influence others. Rally people around you. Now you you may ask how do you keep up with you? all oh, you have Facebook, you have actually networking is not all, all about technology. Because in, in Africa I think 70% cannot access internet, but they are relational. They are areas. At least someone knows. If I can uh, let you uh, give you this small experience in our, in our country, like in those old days, even in the current situation, current days and in villages, people communicate. Some people have never seen a phone. Even those big phones, even these ones I have seen in America, those body phones, many people have never seen them, but they communicate, you know, they keep in touch. They are networked with their friends. How? By spending some time to meet someone. If you invest time in someone, that shows you are interested in that person. And that's how you start your relationship with this person. A relationship you shouldn't go for a benefit, just if a person interested in the other person, what they do, invest in time in them, that is how you build your relationship with this person. And this person will be willing to lie behind you on any idea that you come up with. So, that is the, the other part of it, uh, the relationship thing. Now, to us, in our group, in Cornerstone, we work together on projects, like right now, I'm sure you guys have a couple of projects that you're working on. Uh, but of course we have those people who are not outgoing, you know. Relationship is not all about being able to put people, but just being able to convince, influence others to buy into your idea you want. On your project, some people give in all their best, does it stay behind? That is okay. You have to sacrifice something to be able to keep close with that person. If it calls for you to spend some more time to make sure that the friend is on, on board, do that for the sake of your relationship with that person. Uh, that is in that direction. I want to cross over to what we are doing right now. I am Charles. When you promised the president that we were going to go home, because we feel like uh, our country needs us. America doesn't need us. They, you guys don't need us at all. And most of the guys uh, from the developing countries, they are not needed here in America. They are needed, if they can be wanted here, because they can be paid to do something, but that's not a need, they are not needed. Without them, someone else will do it. But if we are needed in our countries because, like, the skill we get here, <coughs> we could sell a couple of people. If I get to do something in Uganda right now, I am touching more people than if I stay here in America. I would get a job, I would make good money. It doesn't value value to my community. So we chose to go home to be the change agents in our country, in our communities. We want to be that change that we want to see in people. And we have to be part of that. We want to be the building blocks to that change, that development that we want to see. Even in America, America was developed by many people who sacrificed. You are grand, 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 great grand. They worked so hard to be Able to put up whatever you guys are enjoying right now because of their sacrifices. Others died in the wars. 
but they did it because they wanted their generations to come to have, to have a decent life. We, it's us. We are glad that the opportunity is, is right now, and we have, we have been able to get opportunities to learn, get exposed, to be able to take it back home and be part of that building generation. We are glad. So we decided to go home. Charles is involved. He's running a, a telecom company. He started one with our partner from Phoenix. Uh, they have invested close to 400,000 US dollars. That is uh, close to a billion Ugandan shillings. He's the director, co-founder. Uh, alongside that, we are working together with him to help university students when they are about to graduate, uh, to help them with the life skills, especially things that you need at workplace. Because in Africa, they ask us when you graduate, they ask you for experience. You guys, you, you have the opportunity here. As a student, you are working. So by the time you graduate, you have accumulated enough experience that you need to get the real job, your dream job. In Africa, once you're in school, in Uganda, that is it, full time. You get to class by eight, you live around five, six. So there's no way. And we don't have businesses that are working in the night. So you can't work anyway. Now, so we are working with those young, young people, train them. Uh, most of the things we are, we, are, we are training them in, we got them through the School of Business here at East Central and through the interaction that we had with the different people, professors here at East Central. So we feel like that is the other way we can, apart from making profit with our businesses, we want to help people, empower them with these skills. So we are doing that as a joint project, me and Charles. Alongside, we are also running a chain of uh, guest houses, and we want to have a tour company. We, we have four young men, we are mentoring. They are running around with that. So that's how we are operating. That's a joint project we have with Charles. I am running a, a poultry farm training school. I came up with that idea because when I was growing up, I lived with my mom and we took care of chickens. Uh, then when I graduated from high school, I worked with a poultry company and I fell in love with that. But also, if I came here, I was running a poultry farm for a thousand bucks every month. And uh, it's a business most rural Ugandans do because it has market. I chose to do that in a partnership with my friends in Knoxville uh, for business because I'm making money. Uh, but also helping other people to have uh, a, sustainable, a sustainable pro business they can do at their home, especially the young people and the women who spend most of their time at home. We open it up for people in the communities to come and train, we train them how to raise chicken. But uh, in addition, we talk to them about Christ. Uh, I know it's not a big deal here, but we are talking about Christ and we talk to them in that direction. Because you cannot talk to someone when they are not able to feed themselves, then you bring the name of Jesus Christ. They will say, what are you talking about? But if you have something going on and you are able to sh show them that there is hope, and uh, you are not giving them aid, like you guys here most of the uh, I've seen in churches, they say, oh, we can give you food, come. Yeah, it makes sense for that day. But what happens the following day? I get to keep giving me food, you know? How can I be able to gain something that can help me to sustain, first of all, myself, my family, and my community? So, through our outreach programs, we take it to the community people, train them, they come in, we train them. But also I stay with the 16 young men 
I call them young men, but others are older than me by 10 years. But because I'm in authority, I take them as young men. We stay with them for one full year. We train them. We mentor them. I look for other people who are old enough and who have been successful in these business areas to mentor these young men. I use the uh, community churches, leaders, to come in and talk to them about Christ. But also, I will train them business skills, marketing, accounting, computer, for one full year. So when they graduate from that place, we want them to run a business. That can help them as individuals, but also take care of their families, and also train other people in the communities where they come from. All of them, 100% of these people, they are the common character we have, characteristic we have, is poverty, that is in the mind and the economic part. But we are very hopeful and optimistic that in the next three or four years, they won't be poor again. So, my coming to the US, I came to Knoxville, Tennessee, to talk to a church. They invited me to go speak to them. They are interested in funding some of our graduates, when they graduate, it takes 15,000 US dollars to have to set up a business for this person, including land and a house for this person. Then, let them run around with an idea and help their communities. But since Ella is another home, I wrote to Dr. Nambi and said, can I pass by, meet my people? She said, oh, sure, come. You can speak to my class, that's why I'm here. If you have any question, just raise it up. You mentioned, and I want to make sure we all understand something when I talk about it. If you're in a foreign country and you're not sure you're going to get your luggage, I'm pretty sure in America you wouldn't have gotten your luggage. Because I don't think we have that service. So, I mean, please don't take offense on the foreign. So I really believe that here we would have not gotten the luggage. So, uh, you talk about the training of the young men. Are there things like your program also for young women? Uh, in the next uh, two, three years, we're moving towards that direction. But for now, I am a gentleman. Uh, I am staying with these, these guys. We have a hostel and all the things, a dormitory. Uh, it would be sure. risky. To have young men, young young men staying with the young ladies, so uh, Andy, we are we have just started. We just, you know, in the early stage, but we are thinking about that in the next two three years. If God gives us the grace, we we'll do that. Yeah. As you think about the questions, I can show you a couple of pictures that I have here. But I. It, it could be a question outside what I've talked about. Just a question of, you know, information, something like that. Some lady said she grew up, did you grow up in West Africa, is that? Mm -hmm. Did I get you right? Oh, yeah, I grew up in Guinea. Guinea-Bissau? No, just Guinea. Guinea? Mm -hmm. Unless Uganda is better than Guinea. <laughs> that one, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But you see, now, I, th I think she knows what is happening in the, that part of the, the world. And uh, so I had a grand opening of that, that training school. And I had uh, uh, these guys, one of this guy here is my my partner, he stays in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's a rich guy. But he's just looking for where of spending his, his wealth with another person. Uh, this guy here, is, he's a governor, and he heads a, a, a million people in that area. We call them districts. He's a political head. He was excited when I when I was inviting him, he asked me about what he said. He wasn't sure because he felt like 
the idea was, you know, something strange. Why do you spend your time with the people? How are you going to get the money? So I had to meet with him in his office. I took him through the vision and uh, he asked me a couple of questions. He was convinced. He drove by before the day just to be sure because of politicians fear to be uh, embarrassed in public. So when he drove into the, the farm, he was amazed. And he told me he wanted to partner with me to see if we can work with the government and we replicate the same model to different places. I said, that is a good idea. But for now, you don't want to mix politics with the business. You can lose track. So that is an opportunity which is there, but if for to protect your vision and other things, you need to go slow on that such such money that may come. Uh, uh, this guy here, that is a team that came from Tennessee. This guy here, he was an attorney uh, general, like a legal advisor to the government for five years. It's a big thing. Uh, he showed up after selling him the idea. He wants me to work with him. Uh, he's a congressman. He wants me to help him reach uh, his, his community through trainings. I told him, okay, we can organize a schedule, bring 10 to 20 people. Uh, we schedule them. We'll be able to work with him. Uh, that is my truck. I'm driving. Then, the sand. Uh, that's the kitchen of my house. That is my house. Uh, it's beautiful. So that's corn uh, we do on the farm. Uh, that's my friends. They came hiking, and one of them is my wife to be soon. Uh, that's it. Give me some questions, please. Yeah. Uh, so, how did your family feel when you ran into President Hargrave and you were given this opportunity? My mom was sad because she wasn't sure where I was going. And also, she was overjoyed by the fact that I was given that opportunity. Uh, like any other person in Uganda, even married people, can leave their families if they are told they are coming to the United States. They can sell all their property, like the people in the Bible, to just come to the U.S. And they will never go back. Um, the picture of Richard's house, you, I want you guys to understand that. I said, Richard, is that a brick house? And he said, yes. I was like, wow. But it's not just a brick house. He made his bricks yes. for his house. So the things, little things like that, we take for granted. I mean, I thought, wow, they have a, he has a brick house in Uganda, but he physically made the bricks yeah. and built his house. So that house is close to 35,000 US dollars. And in Uganda, we don't run a credit card, by the way. <laughs> Everything is cash. Actually, even in, I think, in Nepal. Nepal. Right. Yeah, right. cash. If you don't have it, you can't eat. That's how tough it is. Question? Please, <clears throat> just ask a question. Ask about Uganda. What is it like in Uganda? Because right now, you are running you're helping this lady. I can talk about her, her program briefly. Mm -hmm. Through her, that's how we came here. Because these guys had come to help her. She runs a program of ladies. I, I'm sure all of you during your high school, you heard about invisible children. Stop a coin, things like that. It, ran, it went viral. Uh, and is the Californian movie stars. They made money out of that. And that's why I, I think in Uganda, if you just come right now and say, oh, we are helping, helping, you have to be careful. Because some Americans are making money out of the miseries we have. And we are saying, no, I think we need to handle it ourselves. Uh, Sister Rosemary, she works with a couple of ladies who were once uh, uh, wives so that man called the coin, the invisible children business, we call it invisible children business, because they are making money out of him. Uh, 
So she, this guy just came and rounded the families, uh, communities, and took away with the small girls, the age of 9, 20, 12, like, handed, he handed them over to his soldiers as wives, and also he took some for himself. So, and uh, once you give birth, like two, three kids, you are useless. So these women ran back. They, remember when he was taking them? They had nowhere to stay when they came back. Because he made them to kill their people. So you kill your mom, you kill your parents, so that you have nowhere to go back. And in the community, you are like a misfortune. So these women, when they came back, ran back after maybe six, seven, ten years in the, in the, war, in the, in the bush, they had nowhere to stay. Sister Rosemary, as a nun, and the, with the passion and the compassion to help other people, she took them in. And the, she's helping them, train them with business skills. And some of the, the programs she's running is a sewing business. And that's why you guys are going to help her, I'm sure you help her, to raise those. You know. So, Uganda is, it has a mix of rich people and poor people. Majority are poor. 65% are people below the age of 30. So, we have 35 million people. Based on the census, the counting of 2007, 35 million people. And the 65% people were below the age of 30. And out of the 65, 40% are people below the age of 18. So briefly, Uganda is a country of children. Strange, but true. That means the economic mass of that country you only need to feed, feeding people. How do you feed them? You need to, to be able to have economic activity going on. So, if you guys are bored, okay. So, if this many people are like below the poverty rate and everything like that, mm -hmm. so how would you describe the average daily life of your people? Uh, I think if God was fair, Ugandans would be the richest country in the world. We work so hard, especially our mothers. Uh, in the typical village, people wake up at around 6 in the morning, every day, Monday to Saturday, go to work, dig, uh, like that's plowing the uh, tilling the land. We use traditional rudimentary uh, tools, farm tools, like a hoe, which is like, I don't know, how to, something small like this. It has a, some handle. That's what they do. They dig from that 6 a.m. up to around 12, full time, not relaxing, no. Because there, you are not working after time, you are working after a piece of uh, work. So you can't relax, because if you relax, you stay behind. So ladies go up to that. Gentlemen, stay a little bit longer. So ladies get off, go to prepare food for lunch. So the guy comes back around 3 4 for lunch. So from 6, actually not from 6, from 8 in the evening of yesterday, because you go to bed around 10, you eat your last meal, the dinner at around 8. So you come back and eat up to, for the next meal, to come around 3, the following day. 8 p.m., 3 p.m. So after that, they go back for evening work. Same thing. Year in, year out. That is the village. In the city, where most of the youth are, youth have left the villages because there's nothing going on. 
Uh, you wish there is a way I could show you some of these. Uh, can is this projector able to? You can pass it around. This is one of the means of transport. The youth, they are using uh, motorbikes, the bikes, for transport. Those who have not gone to school, that is what they do for a living. And that calls for a 24, 24 hours job. So in, in town, in the city, you wake up around 7. By 8, you are at work. Then you walk up to around 5.30, maybe. You only have one hour for, for lunch. You go back. From 5.30, there's a traffic. You reach home around 10 in the night. 5 a.m., you wake up because you need to be there to be the traffic. So that is, you know, we work so hard. But the employment, if you make, $200 a month as a graduate, that's a good deal. $200, you can blow it in a week here. There, if someone is been, he takes care of the family, he, you know, he has to take care of other people. And in our country, we, we have the extended families. You, your parents, your cousins, nieces, something like that going behind. So you have us, like for me, I'm the first person to go to college, just finished high school in my family. Uh, and we, family, when I talk about family, it's not like the immediate. We are like 300 people, you know? So once they know that you have gone to school, now they bring all their children there, you know, send them to you for you to help them. So it becomes a big burden for you to raise up in the community. That is my family. Then the community looks up to you. Oh, can you talk to my, oh, can you help my, something like that. So there is no way you will ever raise up. But by the grace of God, you can be able to touch another person. Another question. We can, if we feel bored, we can close and go. Richard, will you tell them about how um, you and Charles would not have been friends had it not been for Cornerstone, yeah. how kind of the diversity of the country and, and the... the... You know, like, for where she comes from, from the north, my tribe, we can't share a table with them. Here, you guys, whether you are from Oklahoma, or whether you are from California, you are Americans, okay? The only thing they say, oh, you have an accent, where are you from? You are from the south, oh, you are from the north. Something like that. But to us, the other person speaks, like what if she spoke in her language? I don't understand. Like six hours away from where I come from. And uh, we have the civil tribal conflicts. Like if you, I could compare Texas versus Oklahoma. Those, uh, these are, this is for, for you guys, like OU versus the uh, like it's a big thing, tensed, but it is for fun. To us, it's war. People die. So we tribes don't mix. Like in our school, uh, they made sure that they picked one person. We have, uh, I think we have 52 tribes in Uganda, and the, and every tribe comes with a language. So so all the, those are languages. So what they made sure is to pick one individual from each tribe. So you go in this school, 25 of you, everybody is speaking his own language. And the only uniting language is English. So, like for me, I got a guy from this, their tribe. And he was staying on my <coughs> bed. I had never thought that I would ever have time or share a roof with the person from that side. And that is what they also believe. Because our parents fought and they said that tribe, they kill, they eat people. So all of those are things that we knew in our mind. So when I got there, I find these guys. I almost left school. And the same thing, this guy almost left.
but we spent some time to get to know one another by force, of course, because you, you have no option and you need to have a friend. So we discovered that it was not about the tribe, it wasn't about where you come from, it was just about personality or an individual. So we, we found ourselves mixing in and we blended in. Charles, I wouldn't miss him, but now we are tight friends. So we were given an opportunity to be close and meet one another. And uh, now when I meet Sister Rosemary, I embrace her as my sister. So. Any other questions? Thank you.